Part 7. I would now like to return to Alice Bailey's book entitled The Externalization of the Hierarchy. She wrote, the Masonic movement will meet the need of those who can and should wield power. It is the custodian of the law. And it is the seat of initiation. It holds in its symbolism the ritual of deity. And the way of salvation is pictorially preserved in its work. The methods of deity are demonstrated in its temples. And under the all-seeing eye, the work can go forward. And I've shown you from their own materials that they worship Lucifer. So the Masons are expecting someone to lead them into a world where there will be no restrictions on the individual's right to reason. In this world, man will be free to decide for himself in all things. According to the Masons, man's desire is to be free of any restraints on his freedom. Religion is not to instruct him how to lead a good life. He must be free to choose his own course of action because he must be free to choose whatever action pleases him. This is the vision of the future for the Mason. What Mr. Pike is saying is that the God of the Bible gave man free choice. And then that God restricted his free choice by teaching him to do or not do certain things by saying, Thou shalt and thou shalt not. For man to be totally free, to make all his own decisions, he must remove God and his moral absolutes from the world then man will be completely free to exercise his free choice. A God who restricts man's freedom of choice is a tyrant. That is what Mr. Pike is saying. Additional proof comes from other quotations from Mr. Pike. Masonry allows free, full freedom. Masonry allows full freedom of thought and freedom of conscience and the right of private judgment. These ideas of Mr. Pike are hard to understand. If a Christian goes to a Bible-believing church and that church teaches him that the God in the Bible has instructed him not to steal, for instance, Mr. Pike appears to be saying that the Christian is to come out from that church because no church has the right to restrict your right of private judgment. This is utter nonsense. A Christian freely chooses to follow Christ, and when he does so, he will wish to obey his commandments and moral teachings. But Mr. Pike said that no church has the right to expect its members to follow a righteous path. Mr. Pike continues, as Masons, we deny the right of any church to prescribe to men what they shall believe. Here it is again. This is pure nonsense. I will further explain why I believe this way a little later. When the church governs, man is ruled by superstition. And when the state governs, he is ruled by fear. Ignorance must be transmuted into wisdom and superstition into an illumined faith before men can live together in harmony and understanding. If this is harmony and understanding, I don't want it. But there it is, in his own words. The battle lines are being drawn, but Mr. Pike is dramatically wrong when he says on page 530, If all men were Masons, that world would be a paradise. Because Pike's world, where only Masons live, is so horrible that the moral mind cannot comprehend it. So if you want to know your more, if you want to know more about the Masonic future, you might consider reading my second book entitled The New World Order. 
because it is the future of America and ultimately the world unless we understand what it is and then inform others and then prevent it. The choice is ours. I must again, once again, I must once again be honest with you. Not everyone agrees with my book entitled The New World Order. Now I, I know that that comes as a surprise to all of you, but it is true. In fact, I want to, I want to read you a letter from one such person. He wrote this letter to me on October the 9th, 1999. To Ralph Epperson, read The New World Order. This book is so st <laughs> this book this book is so stupid that I couldn't stop reading it. Now, if a man uh, finds a book is too stupid to read, then you throw it away, burn it, give it away, put it aside. But here he says, I couldn't stop reading your stupid book. Talk about right wing. <laughs> Talk about right wing crazies. You're the worst. Now think about this. One would think that if he thought my book was crazy, he should have said, you are the best crazy person I've ever seen. He's saying here that I am the worst crazy person, which means he thinks I, <laughs> he thinks I am truly intelligent. But then he betrays his judgment when he ends with this comment. I think that Bill Clinton is the best president this country ever had. And I will, I will leave it up to you to tell me which one of us is crazy. But enough of this. Please let me return to the subject at hand. I want you to know the situation is worse than this. Albert Pike wrote many other books, but one entitled Agenda of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry has a quotation that is very revealing and should be examined before the reader proceeds with a further study of the goal of the Masonic Lodge. He wrote this book in 1888 and was published by the 33rd Degree Council. The th key revelation in this book is the evidence that Albert Pike does not believe in a creator God. This quote taken from page 109 of Pike's comments on the 28th degree should clear up the question once and for all as to who the God of the Masons, called the great architect of the universe, really is. Because it is not the God of the Bible, the God who created the universe. The first ten words of the Bible, Genesis 1-1, read, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Notice that this had to be a creation out of nothing, since the word beginning implies that there was a time before the creation when there was nothing. There would have been no need for a beginning if God took existing materials to form the universe. Now the Bible teaches that it was Jesus, that part of the triune God, who created the universe. But Albert Pike renounced the first ten words of the Bible when he wrote this. To say that the world came forth from nothing is to propose a monstrous absurdity. However, there's no mistake about who their God is. As I said, he's called the great architect of the universe. He is not the creator God of the Bible. He is not Jesus, as we have seen. According to Mr. Pike, if you believe that the universe was created out of nothing, then you believe in a monstrous absurdity. Mr. Pike repeated this thought in his book entitled Magnum Opus on page 18 of his closing instructions of the 32nd degree ritual. This is what he wrote. As the world is unproduced and indestructible, and as it had no beginning, and will have no end. Now let me review what he just said. If the world was unproduced, there was no producer. If it had no beginning, it was not created out of nothing. If it was not created, there was no creator. If there was no creator, there is no Jesus. 
And to believe in Jesus is to believe in a monstrous absurdity. So the Christians and the Jews who believe that the God of the Bible created the universe out of nothing believe in a monstrous absurdity. Apparently, in an effort to make certain that the Mason who reads his books would not miss the point, Mr. Pike repeated the thought on page 66 of this 32nd degree in his book entitled Legenda. But it will certainly be difficult to prove by any direct language of the scriptures that God created the universe out of nothing. So the words in the Bible that read in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth are not direct language because according to Mr. Pike there is no such thing as direct language proving this. <clears throat> Yet it can be proven that God did create the universe out of nothing. Before we examine the next area in this speech, may I explain the laws of thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is the study of heat exchange. Now let me introduce you to Dr. Henry Morris, who phrased it in his commentary on Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 of his book entitled, The Defender's Study Bible. By the way, but while I'm discussing Dr. Morris, may I mention that he was the founder of the Institute of Creation Research, perhaps the world's leading creationist organization. If you are not on their mailing list, may I suggest that you become so by visiting their website shown here. Now this is what Dr. Morris wrote. The laws of thermodynamics are the most universal and best proved generalizations of science applicable to every process and system of any kind. The first law states that no energy is now being created or destroyed. And the second law states that as energy is being converted and used, it decays, meaning it dispenses, it disperses, it disperses and cannot be used again. What he is saying is that once you use energy, you cannot regather it and use it again. A match is potential energy, but once you light it, it releases its energy and you cannot regather it and use it again. So Dr. Morris here means that someday the universe will lose all of its heat and there will be a heat equilibrium because the universe will decay until all temperatures will be the same, all locations in the universe will be the same temperature. There will be no more hot and cold. I like to use the example of a tub of cold water into which you drop scalding hot ball bearings. After a while the heated ball bearings will give off all of their heat and there will be a state of equal temperature. Since this eventuality, since this eventual heat equilibrium of the universe has not yet occurred, and since it will occur in time, if these processes of decay continue, the second law proves that time, and therefore the space matter time universe, had a beginning. The universe must have been created. But the first law says it couldn't have been self-created. The only resolution of the dilemma posed by the first and second laws is that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. But Albert Pike, perhaps the greatest mason of all time, said it himself that Dr. Morris was wrong. At least three times. He was saying that there was no creation. Now let me show you a little evidence by a little example that he is dramatically wrong. This is a picture <laughs> taken uh, of me in 1985 when I was thinking about the universe out in the desert. It was taken when I had hair and all of that thinking must have made me nearly bald just a few, <laughs> just a few years later. 
This bright pink slice represents the energy in the universe. The high point on the left side represents the universe fully created with all of the energy it needs. Then as it goes through eternity, the energy is decreasing. And then at the right side, all of the energy has been used and there will be a heat equilibrium. That means that the universe has a life expectancy just like the Bible that talks about a 70 year average life. So once again, the universe had a beginning and a middle and then an end and then it had no energy left to utilize and there was a heat equilibrium. So the universe has a life of a certain amount of years and only a certain amount of years, meaning it could not have been given an eternal life. The line on this slide represents eternity, although it would be impossible for me to show it all on this slide because there is no beginning and no end to time. But just for the sake of our discussion, let's presume that this line represents billions and billions of years. Now in this slide, I have shown the universe life on one end and me at the other. That means that the universe had its life way before I thought about it. And the conclusion I must make is that this is impossible because the universe hasn't burned out yet. I can see the sun and it is, it is still burning and this scenario is not true. And this is another possibility. The universe has not been created and it is in a future date. Obviously I could not be thinking about the universe if it had not been created yet. So this scenario is impossible as well. The third scenario is the only possibility. The universe has already been created and I am somewhere inside its life, which means it is not burned out yet, but it will someday. I hope this explanation has made sense to you. Because even though I've lost much, <laughs> much of my hair from all of this thinking, I can still think with what I have left. So Albert Pike's statement, if you believe in a created universe, you believe in a monstrous absurdity, is the monstrous absurdity. Let me now discuss one more evidence that this claim by Albert Pike is dramatically wrong. This is a picture of Sir Fred Hoyle, one of the world's leading astronomers, until he passed away several years ago. He is actually Sir Fred Hoyle, having been knighted in 1972 by Queen Elizabeth for his work in astronomy. Fred Hoyle coined the phrase, the Big Bang, that attempts to explain that the universe was once a small ball of energy and matter, which exploded for some unknown reason, producing the universe as we see it today. By the way, those who believe in the Big Bang Theory never answered the question. Why, I'm sorry, where, where did this little ball of energy and matter come from? So they want us to believe this little ball has been there forever and on some date in the past, it simply exploded. And they do not explain why it suddenly exploded. Because they will not deal with the creator who created the universe out of nothing. In a famous 1950 BBC radio series, Hoyle called the idea of an explosion of the little ball of matter and energy preposterous. He said, the Big Bang Theory refers to an epoch that cannot be reached by any form of astronomy. And in more than two decades, it has not produced a single successful prediction. He wrote a book entitled The Intelligent Universe in 1983, in which he wrote, it is apparent that its chances of life originating by accident are so remote that they can be completely ruled out. Life cannot, cannot, cannot have arisen by chance. He compared the random appearance of a single cell to the likelihood that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard 
might assemble a 747 from the materials therein. And we owe our existence to another intelligence which, as part of a deliberate plan, created a structure for life that is far too complex to have risen by random processes. This is a picture of Chandra Wickramasinghe, the professor of applied mathematics and astronomy at University College, Cardiff, in England. And this is a poor quality photocopy of an article by Jeffrey Levy that appeared in a daily London Express on Friday, August the 14th, 1981. As you can see, the headline for the article reads, when two skeptical scientists put their heads together and reach an astonishing collusion, a conclusion, there must be a God. These two men each made their own calculations on the probability of life starting spontaneously independently. Professor Wick Robinson said, I am 100% certain that life could not have started spontaneously on Earth. He found the odds against the spark of life igniting accidentally were staggering. 10 to the 40,000th power. Just as a means of making this figure understandable, let me put it this way. 1 in 10 to the tw second power means 1 chance in 100. 1 to the third power means 10 times 10 times 10, or 1 to the thousandth power. So 10 to the 40th thousandth power would be approximately 12 pages of typewritten zeros of 55 lines of 60 spaces per page. Yet some scientists have estimated that there are only 10 to the 80th power infinitesimal particles in the universe as we know it. In other words, the chances of life originating by chance has no chance. So these scientists have each independently determined there must be a crater God. Sorry, Albert Pike, you are wrong. Science says there must be a crater God, and Pike says there is no crater God. Let me show you a quote from Mr. Pike's book entitled Morals and Dogma that will help you understand just what type of man he was. The horse, the dog, the elephant are as conscious of their identity as we are. They think, dream, remember, argue with themselves, devise, plan, and reason. So now you know why your dog is chasing his own tail. He's reasoning. Now the next question is, have the horse, the dog, and the elephant been able to reason it out that there was a greater God? Because if they have, they would be smarter than Mr. Pike because he hasn't. But there is much more to the writings of Albert Pike. He wrote the book Liturgy in 1868, and on page 236 of his discussion of the 30th degree, he wrote, You already know that Scottish masonry is the enemy of all oppression, injustice, and usurpation. She labors to emancipate men from their own ignorance, which enslaves them in order that they may emancipate themselves from the bondage of spiritual, spiritual tyranny. So the candidate is once again exposed to the idea that religion is the enemy of the Masons. That is what he meant when he said spiritual tyranny. The initiate is told that he must punish his enemies as early as in the degree of Master Mason, meaning the third degree. He is told that he's not only to punish his enemies, he is to destroy them. In this Masonic book entitled A Bridge to Light, Rex Hutchins has the candidate recite the duties taught him in the previous degrees. 
The ninth of these duties is that he obligates himself to destroy, please notice the word is destroy, ignorance. The goal of this war is the restitution to men of the primitive truth, of free thought and the rights of conscience. Mr. Pike explained the reason for their concern in this quote taken from the 30th degree ritual of the Masonic Lodge. This order has for its mission the avenging of an awful crime, not by the punishment of those that committed it, for they have long since gone before the judge of all mankind, but by the destruction of that by which those men were but the miserable instruments of arbitrary and irresponsible power, of tyranny over the conscience, and by the establishment everywhere of well-ordered liberty. We work in secret because we can do so more efficiently. It is important that I point out again that these Masons are out to destroy government and religion in secret. This becomes important when you ask your friend or relative who is a Mason if my charges are correct. You cannot expect him to confirm my contentions. He must answer in the negative because of the oath that he has taken as a Mason not to reveal any of their secrets. So the only way you will know that I am right is to read their own literature because that is not secret and as we are seeing, it truly informs all who read it or read it what their goals are. I have to go back to something we discussed very early in the speech. You might remember that we discussed the historical fact that Jacques de Molay, the 22nd and last Grand Master of the Templars, was burned at the stake in the 14th century. On the 11th of March, 1314, he was publicly burned in front of the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. So the Masons teach that Pope Clement V, the representative of the Church, and Philip the Fair, the King of France, were guilty of the most infamous deceit and ultimately the death of Brother de Molay. But Mr. Pike points out that the King and the Pope were not the guilty ones but they were the representatives of the powers of the king and of the clergy for all time. So it appears as if the Masons are not only out to avenge the real murder of Jacques de Molay, but the symbols of that authority itself, governments and Christianity. So far the reader has been exposed to only a series of small clues as to who the combatants are in this struggle, and now becomes appropriate to more clearly identify the two sides. One who attempted to do that, albeit in symbolic language, was Albert Pike in his book entitled Liturgy. This is what he wrote. The long war between the evil and the good, between Michael and his angels and the dragon and his angels shall end, and the serpent and his angels shall be overcome and shall pass away and be seen no more forever. Notice that Albert Pike just predicted the overcoming of the serpent. Chapter 20, verse 2 of the book of Revelation in the King James Version says this about the dragon and the serpent. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan. We have seen the evidence that the Masons serve the serpent god called Lucifer, and it is not expected, not expected that Mr. Pike would reveal the secret that the over, overcomer would be the devil. And it does not seem reasonable for Mr. Pike to work for a god who is going to be overcome by the god of the Bible, the enemy that he's taken oath to vanquish. Yet he is saying that Lucifer, also called Satan, the devil and known symbolically as the dragon and serpent, is going to be overcome by God. 
the only thing that makes sense and fits with the evidence we have examined so far is that Pike considers Michael and his angels to be the serpent and that they shall be, quote, overcome by the serpent, also known as the dragon, end quote, the god of the Masonic Lodge. So Pike is saying that the god of the Bible, symbolized as the serpent, will be overcome at the end of the war. Perhaps the best way I can illustrate this principle is by showing you a drawing taken from a bridge to light written by Rex Hutchins, the 33rd degree mason. This book was published by the 33rd degree council. This is a photocopy of one of the first pages of the book showing the signatures of eight men on the rituals and ceremonies, ceremonies committee of the masons showing that they approved of the material in this book. So this is official information. This is a drawing he placed on page 252 and he titled it, The Figure of an Aged Man and His Reflection. But he does not provide the reader with any explanation as to why he calls it that. So let's look at it and see if we can see an aged man and his reflection. First of all, the word reflection means a mirror image. This is a mountain lake, a mountain range, and it, it it's, <laughs> this is a mountain range and its reflection in a lake, meaning the bottom is the opposite of the mountain range, but it is upside down. Now let's see if we can see the reflection he said we would see. First of all, look at the man's shirt. It is black in the top and white on the bottom. But notice other differences. The sash he is wearing changes from white on the top to black on the bottom. The words on both sides are not the same. So Mr. Hutchins is lying to us. This is the close-up of the man on the top. Notice that he is wearing what appears to be a crown topped by a cross. So this man appears to be a king representing the merger of government and Christianity, the two enemies of the Masonic Lodge. Now let's turn the picture upside down and look at the aged man on the bottom. That doesn't look like a reflection of the aged man on the top at all. In fact, it looks like a demon. But notice one important thing. The crown has changed. The crown represents a kingship, a symbol of a government authority or the government itself. But notice that the cross is no longer on top. So the aged man represents the future, a government led by a demon without the influence of Christianity. So Mr. Hutchins is telling us a great deal in this drawing. This is the face of our future, a government led by a demon. Now let me return to the material we were discussing before I showed you this picture. He is saying that the vanquished foe, the God of the Bible, is evil and will no longer reign. This is Pope John Paul II wearing a mitre, a tall ornamented cap with peaks in front and back worn by the Pope as a mark of his office. As far as I know, there's no other religion that wears a mitre. It is strictly a Catholic symbol, at least in the modern era. However, it does have a use in the Egyptian era. This is a wall mural of Amun-Ra, the Egyptian sun god, shown on the left. And so this head covering could very well be a model for the Catholic mitre worn by current popes. Pike wrote in his book, Legenda, the mitre of the one, meaning a symbol of the Catholic Church, and the crown of the other, meaning the government, were the symbols and remain the symbols of the enemies whom it is the purpose of the order of the Temple of Solomon, meaning the Masons, to war against without remission or relaxation. So it appears as if this battle is between the Masons and the Catholic Church and the government. 
but there is still more to the secret, and the Masons keep releasing the clues. This is the oath called an obligation that the, Masons ta the Mason takes at the 18th degree, according to Albert Pike. I further promise and swear that I will observe and obey the decrees and mandates that may be transmitted to me by the Supreme Council of the 33rd degree. So the 33rd degree council has the power to order any Mason in their jurisdiction to obey their orders. The Masonic War revolves around a legend surrounding the building of King Solomon's Temple as recorded in the Old Testament of the Holy Bible. The reasons the Masons call the building of King Solomon's Temple a legend is because they have added additional parts of it that are not in the Bible, so they call it a legend. Rex Hutchins in his book entitled A Breach of Light explained, Thus the biblical account of the story of Hiram is occasionally at variance with the legend as told in Masonic instruction. Mr. Hutchins con confirmed the thought with this quotation. The legend of the degrees are all symbolic. We are urged to learn the symbolic meaning. In particular, what the Master Hiram symbolizes. And in keeping with all of his other statements about reading, studying, and reflecting, Mr. Pike and others are loyal to this promise. The Masons will reveal the true meaning behind the symbol to anyone who cares enough to make the effort of finding the truth behind the symbol. They will reveal what Master Hiram symbolizes. But let me hasten to point out that this is indeed the very essence of all of the material we've covered during this speech. Once we understand what Master Hiram symbolizes, what is happening in America today will make enormous sense. Pike wrote, the legend is altogether symbolic. And when its symbolism is truly comprehended, becomes surpassingly beautiful. And then Mr. Pike explained that the legend of Hiram is also symbolic. The biblical part of the building of the building of the temple starts in First Chronicles chapter 28 of the Bible, when David, the king of Israel, spoke to his people and said, "The Lord God of Israel said unto me, Solomon." Thy son shall build my house. According to Second Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, Solomon accepted the command of God and built the house, or began to build, began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. He sent out, he sent for the king of a neighboring country, according to other chapters in Second Chronicles, to assist him. And Solomon sent to Hiram, the king of Tyre. Tyre was the capital of Phoenicia in what today is southern Lebanon. It appears to be about 100 miles north of Jerusalem where Solomon was to build the temple. The king sent his father, also named Hiram, but in this case meant Abif. Hiram Abif is the father of King Hiram. The word Abif means father. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 7, that the father was a worker in brass. The Masons have added that he was also a stonemason, meaning a worker in stone as well, but there is no biblical authority for this addition. When he completed his work for Solomon, the Bible in 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 40, says that Hiram made an end of doing all the work that he had made King Solomon for the house of the Lord. That seems to say that Hiram Abiff left Jerusalem after all of the work was done, but the Masons do not end the story there. This is where they really change the details of the building of the temple. Mr. Pike wrote that King Hiram said that he had sent thee, Hiram, sent thee meaning, of course, to Solomon, Hiram, my father, and that we were brothers in the sacred mysteries. The claim by the Masons that King Hiram and his father 
we're both believers in the sacred mysteries is an amazing revelation. This thought clearly shows that the Masons think that both of these men had a belief in Lucifer because the mysteries secretly worship Lucifer, also called Satan, the devil. And Albert Pike put that declaration in writing. There is no scriptural authority for that belief as far as I can tell. The Bible is silent on the beliefs of both King Hiram and his father, but it does have a great bearing on the Mason story. But this assertion poses a real question for the Masons. Why do they think that King Solomon, who worshipped the creator God of the Bible, would want to ask two Lucifer worshippers to build the temple of God? And I will continue to ask that question of any Mason that comes into my life. So as I said, Hiram Abiff finished all the work he had been commissioned to do by King Solomon and presumably returned to his own country. But Masonic legend asserts that Hiram Abiff was murdered before the temple was completed. So what Mr. Hutchins is saying is that the Masons have built a legend around an event that only partially happened, the alleged death of Hiram Abiff. That means they are knowingly not telling the truth to their fellow Masons when they make certain claims about the death of Hiram Abiff. The death of Hiram is covered in the last part of their legend, and a good place to obtain the details is in Coyle's Masonic Encyclopedia, written in 1961. On page 307 of Mr. Coyle's book, under the heading of Hiram Abiff, the author quotes a portion of the ritual in a blue lodge relating to that death. How came Hiram Abiff by his death? In the building of Solomon's temple, he was a master mason, today of course the equivalent of a third degree mason. And at noon, when the men who were building the temple were gone, to refresh themselves, and when he was entered into the temple, three ruffians, meaning three fellow crafts, three second degree masons, planted themselves at the three entrances of the temple. Apparently there were only three doors of the temple. And when he came out, one demanded the master's word of him. In other works by other Masons, this Master's Word is identified as the true name of God. The Masons are saying that Hiram, as a Master Mason, was in possession of this secret, which was only possessed by Master Masons and could not be given to fellow craft Masons. Hiram refused to tell him, and the ruffian struck him. Hiram Abiff went to the other gate, where, being accosted, and making the same reply, he received a greater blow. And at the third gate, the same thing happened, and the third ruffian killed him. The Masons are claimed that Hiram Abiff was beaten by the first two ruffians and then was killed by the last of the three ruffians. Mr. Pike confirmed his explanation of the murder of Hiram Abiff by explaining that the three ruffians were executed by the people after a court trial. Nowhere in the story so far are these ruffians named. However, in other Masonic writings, they write about the names as being, the men as being named Jubilo, Jubila, and Jubilum. Nowhere in my research can I find just what the Masons believe these three names mean, but I have found the evidence that these names, like the name of Hiram Biff, are symbolic and conceal a larger secret. It is my best estimation that these three names are somehow connected to the Masonic search for the light. And the reason I believe this is because it appears as if they are derived from the Latin word meaning light. I checked a recent Latin to English dictionary and it defined the words jubar as a booming light radiance, literally, the light of the sun. When I was a student of the Spanish language during two years of my three years in high school, we learned that there were similarities between the Spanish language and the Latin language. 
One of the things I was being taught was how to conjugate words in Spanish from their root, such as I run, he runs, we run, etc. So it is my opinion that these three names of these ruffians, Jubilo, Jubila, and Jubilam, have a root in the Latin word Jubar, and I am guessing that they mean I am the light of the sun, she is the light of the sun, and we are the light of the sun. But that is just my opinion. It is not contained in any of the Masonic writings that I have ever read. Mr. Pike then explained, henceforward, let our departed master, meaning Hiram Biff, be unto us and unto all Masons the symbol of liberty and his assassins of ignorance, tyranny, and intolerance, that the freedom of the state can only be attained by following ignorance into its darkest dens, and there smiting it, meaning government and religion, mortally and mercilessly. So the Masons want to smite religion and government mortally and mercilessly. And once again, Mr. Pike explains that religion is ignorance. 33rd degree Mason Rex Hutchins goes a little farther in his explanation of the death of Hiram and the attack upon him. He wrote this on page 66 of his book. Hiram is first accosted at the south gate where the instrument of the attack is the rule. In Greek, the word for a rule a code of conduct is canon. Thus we see the church establishing the canon law to regulate conduct. Canon is defined as the laws governing the organizational affairs of a church. This law was to be obeyed with unquestioned loyalty. Hence it is an apt symbol of the suppression of freedom of speech, which might question the divinity and justice of these law, laws. Therefore Hiram, with the rule, is struck where their organs of speech are. This comment by Mr. Hutchins is very puzzling. When I was a member of the Catholic Church for some 36 years, I was not required to obey the canon law with unquestioned Royalty. I was free to accept or reject the teachings of the church, and when I finally put my concerns about the precepts of the Catholics to a test of the Bible and found no scriptural authority for much of what I believed as a member, I freely left the church. There was no retribution by the church. I was free to go when I thought it was appropriate to leave. I left. The point I wish to make is that nowhere is Mr. Hutchins, nowhere in Mr. Hutchins' book is he equally critical of the government of the United States. As a student of the Constitution, I have put some of the laws passed by Congress to a test by this document and found that much of what Congress is doing today is not authorized by its provisions. I consider this to be tyranny, and if I attempt to withdraw as I did when I was a Catholic, I will soon discover that I am not free to leave. For example, if I protest the evidence that most of the money that I pay in federal taxes is being used for unconstitutional purposes, and that I wish to object by not paying those taxes, I am not free to do so there would be retribution on the part of the government if I do not send in my taxes to the Internal Revenue Service. I would go to prison. This act of government would be called tyranny, meaning that you will do what you are told by the government. But you are under no such compulsion by the Catholic Church. And yet Mr. Hutchins claims that he is in opposition to all forms of tyranny. 
So in my opinion, Mr. Hutchins is wrong. He fails to see tyranny when it permeates the government of the United States, but sees tyranny where there is none in the Catholic Church. There must be a reason for this. Why does he see tyranny when there is no tyranny and no tyranny where there is tyranny? And there is an answer to this question. And I'm hopeful that I will make the answer clear a little later as we continue. Mr. Hutchins continues, the instrument of attack at the west gate of the temple was the square. An implement formed of two rigid pieces of metal at right angles to each other. This is once again the two symbols of the Masonic Lodge, the square and the compass. The square represents the merger of civil and religious power, intending to control man's emotions telling him not only what he can do, but also what he can believe. Thus Hiram is struck near the heart, the traditional seat of the affections. Here Mr. Hutchins appears to be referring to the Christian church because it dares to tell mankind that God has a plan for their life. God has instructed man in the Bible that there is a right way and a wrong way to live their lives. But man is free to agree or not to agree. Mr. Hutchins is saying that man should reject all that God teaches mankind. He's also saying that the church and the government have merged to punish the person who wishes to exercise his free choice as to whether or not he should steal. I also find this hard to understand. Is it possible that Mr. Hutchins is suggesting that civil and religious power should not merge to punish the thief? Should they not tell the prospective thief not only what he can do, but also what he can believe about the act of stealing? So Mr. Hutchins is still agreeing that we need government. It is not, it is just, it is just not permissible for to control man's emotions. He continues, the setting mall, the hammer of the early masons, an instrument of brute force, is the fitting symbol of the blind, unreasoning mob. Here Mr. Hutchins is saying that the right, that the people, Mr. Hutchins is saying that the people do not have the right to teach that stealing is wrong, nor to punish a crime of the emotions. Here Mr. Hutchins apparently calls civilized man's desire to prevent the crime of stealing, the people telling him not only what he can do, but also what he can believe. Hutchins continues, it fears the force of the intellect and seeks the destruction of the products of the mind. Hiram is killed at the east gate by a blow to the head, the seat of the intellect. So the people, the blind, unreasoning mob, acting together and pooling their individual right to self-defense, create a government to punish those who commit crimes against others. They base their reasons for this action upon the commandments and laws given to mankind by the God of the Bible. Yet Mr. Hutchins speaks out against these actions because it is his opinion that they represent the merger of civil and religious power intending to control man's emotions, telling him not only what he can do, but also what he can believe. It is remembered that Mr. Hutchins speaks for all of Freemasonry on this subject since his book was published by the 33rd Degree Council. So this must be the official position of all of the Masons worldwide. This, I'll get this slide uh, one out of sequence. After the three assassins are de convicted, they are decapitated as shown in the sash the 10th degree Mason wears. And their heads are hung on a spike over the east, south, and west gates of the temple. This is a drawing of the apron for the 10th degree 
of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry as illustrated in the book entitled A Bridge to Light. The sword that they used to decapitate the three murderers is shown as well. This is the close-up once again of the apron worn by the Mason of the 10th degree and it shows the heads of the three ruffians. Mr. Hutchins points out that the three heads represent ignorance, tyranny, and fanaticism, the three enemies of Masonry. So these enemies are showing, these Masons, these Masons are showing us that they will use violence to destroy their alleged enemies. Now I really want to get controversial and discuss the involvement of the, in the assassination of President Kennedy of the Masons to show you further evidence that some of the Masons were directly involved in his assassination. First of all, remember the explanation of how Hiram was murdered by the three assassins in the rituals of the Masonic Lodge. He explained, uh, Rex Hutchins explained, that Hiram was killed by three blows to his body. The first man hit him where the organs of speech are, meaning the throat area. The second man hit him near the heart area, the traditional seat of the affections. And the third blow was delivered by the assassin as a blow to the head. Now, if you studied the assassination of President Kennedy, you remember that he also had three wounds. To the throat, where the organs of speech are, to an area near the heart, meaning in this case, high in the back. Now think about this. Because of the fact that the president was, seating, was sitting in the back seat of an automobile, the assassins could not shoot him in the area near the heart from the front. They had to shoot him from the rear. And if they shot him high in the back, you could argue that that was near the area of the heart. And the fatal shot was to the head, the seat of the intellect. Now it is my, is it, is it any coincidence that both Hiram Abiff and John Kennedy were assassinated by three blows to the same places? This was in accordance with the symbolic killing of Hiram Abiff. And this is confirmation to me that some of the Masons were deeply involved in the assassination of President Kennedy. May I suggest that you consider watching my two-hour DVD entitled The Kennedy Assassination, Evidence of Conspiracy and Cover-Up, if you want additional evidence of how the president Part 8. Now let me return directly to the murder of Hiram Abiff and what Master Hiram symbolizes because it is the key to this entire speech. This quote is from Mr. Hutchins who confirms Pike's assertion that Hiram himself as a man is but a symbol of something else. The Master Hiram is the symbol of intelligence, liberty, and truth. Notice he is a symbol of something else. Additional details as to what Hiram is, is and what he symbolically represents were provided by other Masons. Mr. Pike also explained that Hiram was a symbol of something else. Hiram, the type of humanity in its highest phase. Hiram Abiff represents the people at large. Hiram is man. So Hiram represents all of the people of the earth, all of mankind, not just one man by that name. And Masonry is now engaged in a battle with the God of the Bible to bring man back to the perfect paradise on earth. If only man can attain a condition where there will be no moral absolutes, then man can attain a perfect state on the earth. That is the symbolic meaning behind the legend of Hiram Abiff. I want the Masons to know that I've accepted their challenge. I've read, studied, and reflected on these things as Albert Pike suggested. Their secret has been discovered, but it has not yet been, com been completed, revealed, completely revealed, <laughs> but it has not been completely revealed as yet. Now let me put what we have learned so far in my own words. 
Hiram symbolically represents all of mankind in the battle between good and evil. He symbolically represents the thought that mankind has been cheated by the God of the Bible when he was, was removed from heaven for deciding that he should decide for himself what was right and wrong. And the civilization that God created with his teachings of moral absolutes has fouled up the earth. And the Masons and the others who believe in the ancient mystery religion intend on doing away with the civilization that God created. And they will live in a new world where God can no longer teach them. Perhaps the best way I can illustrate this truth is by showing you a certification of Masonic membership that a friend of mine, a former Mason, gave me for my records. I have, of course, blacked out his name to protect his privacy. But this certificate was given to him as an evidence of his being a member in good standing of the Masonic Lodge. If you will direct your attention to the top of the certificate, you will see the all-seeing eye of their deity and some Latin words in a red border. This is a close-up of the top of the certification, and you will see the Latin phrase, Ordo ab chao. This translates into order out of chaos. This is the mission of the Masons, to bring the world from a position of chaos into a position of order by removing God from his throne. So it all becomes clear now. This explains why Christianity is under such attack in America. They are out to replace God with Lucifer. I would now like to return to the assassination of Hiram Abib. The names of the three assassins have a far more important hidden or concealed meaning, just like the name of Hiram Abib itself. And the following Masonic writers have explained just what the symbolism is behind the names of these three murderers. The concealed symbolism behind the names becomes a little clearer with this quotation from Mr. Pike. So the symbolism of Hiram and the three assassins now becomes clear. Hiram is mankind murdered by the three assassins, symbolically representing the hands of the church and the government and the abusers of human free choice. Now the student must learn what the Masons plan on doing about this situation. I would now like to discuss the three crowns. This is once again John Robinson, an author on the Masonic Lodge. I had the pleasure of debating him on a live television program in Tampa, Florida in 1990. I had read his first book entitled Born in Blood before we had our debate, and I brought it with me and asked him to autograph it for me, and he graciously consented. I gave him a copy of my second book entitled The New World Order for him to read, and he took it with him. I know that he read it because he wrote about me and my book in his second book entitled A Pilgrim's Path. This is what he said when he was discussing Pat Robertson's book entitled The New World Order. That's the TV evangelist Pat Robertson. One special aspect of Robertson's book seems to have gone unnoticed. A couple of years before Robertson's book, a book was published by an Arizona author named A. Ralph Epperson. It was based upon the same central theme, a Masonic conspiracy to rule the world. I was very pleased by Mr. Robinson's inclusion of information about me and my book, but as I read Mr. Robinson's second book, I counted at least 32 statements that Mr. Robinson made about the Masons that were simply not true. In other words, Mr. Robinson had not done his homework and read the Masonic literature as I had done when I wrote my New World Order book. To flip that. Okay, here's what uh, Robinson said. To me, the message of Freemasonry seems bright and clear. And I like what I see. It is always possible and even probable 
that my understanding is constricted by limited knowledge. And it is my humble opinion, after studying masonry by reading their own works for over 25 years, that he did have limited knowledge about the, quote, message of Freemasonry, end quote. He was not a member of the Masons when we met, at least that's what he told me, but he later became a full 33rd degree Mason, even though he admitted that his knowledge of Masonry was constricted by limited knowledge. Mr. Robinson's entitled, book entitled Born in Blood was published in 1989, and one of the books he could have read but apparently did not was The Deadly Deception by Jim Shaw, a 33rd degree Mason. This book was published in 1988, the year before Robinson had his book published. Mr. Shaw was a 32nd degree Mason when he was invited into the 33rd degree in Washington, D.C. But shortly before he became a 33rd degree Mason, he had given his life to Jesus Christ as his Savior. Mr. Shaw had joined the Masons at an early age, and he wrote that Masonry would become the center of knowledge, wisdom, and religious fulfillment in my life. Then he wrote that he didn't know that in Masonry he would not be allowed to pray in the name of Jesus, nor even to hear or speak his name in the lodge, even in scripture readings. That was true until one day later in life he had an experience with Jesus. Mr. Shaw's book is important because he tells us when, what went on in the 33rd degree rituals. He wrote, The first day of our initiation, I was called into one of their offices and was interviewed by three members of the Supreme Council. I was asked, Of what religion are you? I answered, I am a Christian. And then I asked them, Are you men born again? The man in charge stopped me and said, We are not here to talk about that. We are here to ask you questions. So Mr. Shaw left the room and went out into the lobby and sat down. The next main man came out from the same room and he and Jim Shaw had a conversation. Jim said, I asked him, did they ask you if you were a Christian? He replied, no, and I never intend to be. And then Jim said, the man left through a different door. And Jim Shaw was not invited to go through that second door. So only people who don't intend on being Christians get to go through the second door. And I asked the Christian Masons, will you get invited to go through that second door if you go on to the 33rd degree? And then Mr. Shaw explained a little bit, a bit about the 33rd degree initiation ceremony. The candidate was handed a human skull upside down with wine in it. We drank it and took this oath. May this wine become a deadly poison to me should I ever knowingly or willfully violate this oath to remain silent. So the 33rd degree Mason drinks wine from a human skull. I will let your mind play with that idea. Now we know why Jim Shaw was invited to drink wine from a human skull. It was their way of getting him to understand what would happen to him if he broke his silence about the 33rd degree ritual. But fortunately for us, he did decide to break his oath, and we learned a little about the 33rd degree ritual. Now let me continue discussing John Robinson. 
This is his second book entitled uh, the Pilgrim's Path, A Pilgrim's Path. I read this one shortly after he published it, and in it I found confirmation of something that I knew already. In other words, Mr. Robinson had found at least one thing that I considered to be true about the Masons. He inserted this key quotation into his book about what the three assassins symbolize. In the 30th degree, the ceremony that recounts this historical drama of Hiram Abiff and Jacques de Molay, the candidate is led into a tomb with three skulls on display. The skull on the left wears a crown. The one in the center bears a laurel wreath. And by the way, Albert Pike states that the laurel wreath was an emblem of victory and triumph and sacred to Apollo, god of light. Isn't that interesting? So the lesson here is that whoever wears it has triumphed in his life. Going back now to Mr. Robinson, and the third wears a papal tiara. Notice a papal tiara. The skull bearing the wreath of the hero is Jacques de Molay. The skull with the crown on it represents Philip IV. While the third wearing a tiara represents Pope Clement V. Now the tiara is a Catholic symbol, and on the top of this drawing is a three-tiered crown called a tiara. And this is a close-up, or another drawing actually, of a tiara. It is the tiara that the third skull is wearing. This is a book entitled Paolo the Sixth, about the Pope about three popes ago that we looked at in one of my early one of these earlier uh, uh, parts. As I said, it, was, it is written in Italian and was sent to me by a Catholic priest. And I would like to show you this picture again, and it will now make a little more sense. It shows Pope. Paul the sixth carrying a tiara to the tomb of Jacques de Molay. And on the left side of the picture, I have photocopied the Italian that shows that the Pope is taking the Corona el la tiara, e la tiara, to the tomb of Jacques de Molay. And I would guess that means the crown of the earth. As I said then, I don't understand this. De Molay was a man who renounced Christianity and the Catholic Church, yet he is being given a tiara by the Pope over 700 years after he was burned at the stake by the Catholic Church. Is this a way of saying that Pope Paul VI was a Mason? Why else would a Catholic Pope take a tiara to the tomb of a man who renounced Catholicism? I will let you answer that question yourself. But continuing with the main issue, Mr. Pike discussed what was in what he called the second apartment and what its contents symbolized. The second apartment represents the world, where king and priest, in my opinion meaning government and religion, king and priest trample on liberty and the rights of conscience. It will re be remembered that the Catholic Church conspired with the King of France and burned the leader of the Knights Templar at the stake. But as we shall see, even this explanation about what the crown and the tiara represent does not go far enough. Mr. Pike amplified the meaning of these symbols in the following two quotations. The crown it's, is itself but a symbol. I believe he is saying that the crown represents government. And royalty is but the most common form of tyranny. And here's the second quote. The tiara also is but a symbol. And the pontificate defined as the office of the pope, but the most usual mode in which spiritual despotism manifests itself. So here the reader sees that the symbol represents religion 
and the symbols, plural, represent religion and government. The tiara is starting to come into focus as a symbol of the Catholic Church, presumed by Pike and others to be the official representative of Christianity, and the crown symbolically represents the government. And another quotation of a similar vein, taken from the 15th, 15th degree, reads, Three powers have in all ages imposed, imposed fetters on the human intellect. The kings, meaning tyranny, priests, meaning superstition, and nobles, those who benefit from the merger of state and government called privilege. Here the reader learns a little more about the three enemies, and here the mason learns that he must symbolically behead the three enemies of the lodge. And they draw their swords as a sign that they are willing to accomplish this task by using violence. But Mr. Pike told us that we were not wrong in our assessment. This, my brother, is the true vengeance. We have not hesitated to make known to you the true purpose. Please understand, this is the true purpose of our order, written by Albert Pike, perhaps the greatest Mason of all time, and the man, the man who wrote all 33 of their rituals. So now we are starting to see the true purpose of our Masonic order. It is a world filled with violence, murder, and bloodshed. It is a world filled with vengeance against Christianity and government. And notice that this is, quote, the true purpose, end quote. And this is further confirmed from Mr. Hutchins' book entitled A Bridge to Light. Again, the skull, tiara, and crown are the objects of discourse. The crown represents all those kings and emperors, meaning, in my opinion, representatives of government, who have usurped or abused power, reigned for themselves, and not the people, and robbed a free people of their liberty. Remember that word, liberty. The tiara is not a symbol of any particular religion or creed. I will let the reader decide whether this is true or not, since Mr. Pike has already said elsewhere that it is a pope's tiara. So I think Mr. Hutchins is once again lying to us. Let me show you that true government does not create tyranny as these masons fear. And to do so, I would like to read part of the Declaration of Independence issued, of course, as you know, on July the 4th, 1776. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that amongst these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. There is the only legitimate purpose of government, to protect our unalienable rights to life, liberty, and property. We were given those rights by God, and we protect them by creating government. The word unalienable means that your rights are yours and come from God. And no one, no majority, no minority, no government, no king can take them away. Nobody. Only the grantor can take them away. And if our rights come from God, only God can take them away. 
We were given these rights by God, and we, as I said, we protect them by creating government. So the only legitimate purpose of government is to protect our unalienable rights to life, liberty, and property. If you are interested in learning more about this concept, may I suggest that you read my booklet entitled Government 101. So it is impossible for a government based upon this concept to be a tyrannical government. So these Masons are dramatically wrong. It is an aberration for a government to be tyrannical. Now let me explain this again. The reason they attack Christianity is because the Bible teaches that it was Jesus as part of the triune God who created the universe. Notice this. Every society in the world, except those communist nations who have destroyed the family after it was in place for centuries, has the family as the foundation of their society. Why? Every society encourages families to raise their children. Why? Every society attempts to protect the right to life of their members. Why? And the answer is because Jesus created civilization when he created the universe. He gave all men the unalienable right to life, freedom, and property. Notice I changed the word there. We'll talk about that in a minute. And he encouraged man to create government to protect those rights. Now, I would like to point out a very important distinction. Perhaps you've noticed that I placed the word liberty in a blue front whenever it was used on a slide. And there is a reason for that. There is a major difference between liberty and freedom. You've noticed that this conspiracy keeps talking about liberty. We have a statue of liberty in the New York Harbor. Our Declaration of Independence talks about the liberty each one of us holds. Some of our founding fathers, like Thomas Jefferson, talked about liberty. The Masons have talked about liberty. And I would like to point out the difference between it and freedom. Liberty is unrestrained freedom meaning each person would be free to do whatever they wished without the restraints of morality. Freedom is responsible action, meaning your decision-making is limited to only those actions that do not harm others or their property. I remember learning an old lesson. Your right to swing your arm ends with my nose meaning you can do what you wish unless it harms others. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 21, Jesus taught us that there is a legitimate purpose of government when he said this, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. So Jesus was teaching us that there is a specific purpose of government, and we should understand that we do not render to God when we allow a tyrannical government to violate human God-given rights. Albert Pike brought this information a little more into focus with this explanation. The three assassins are the king, meaning government, the pope, meaning Christianity, and the imprisoned knight, representing the class that benefits from the merger of religious religion and government. So once again, the Mason learns that he has permission to use violence in the war against state and religion. Its mission upon earth, meaning the Masonic mission, the 30th degree of Masonry, is ultimately to exterminate the first, meaning 
religion. Religion, that insider of the second, meaning government, created by those who wish for a moral world because of their religious teachings. And of whom the third is the blind and stupid instrument, meaning the class that benefits from the merger of the two. And it is the 30th degree that the Mason learns that in the 30th degree, the Mason learns that he will be a soldier in this warfare for the rest of his life. Albert Pike wrote, In this chamber, a grave voice announces the duties of a 30th degree Mason. The 30th degree Mason now pursues with feet that never tire and eyes that never sleep. The personification of the three assassins of Hiram. So the Masons have a true purpose, simply stated as the destruction of Christianity. The Christian faith is being destroyed as we speak. And let me bring it home by showing you just how serious the problem is. The picture of Bob Dole, this picture of Bob Dole appeared in the September 6, 1996 Arizona Daily Star, my morning newspaper, and showed him speaking to a Christian school in Dayton, Ohio, during his presidential campaign. And this is a photograph of Bob Dole in the January 1994 Scottish Rite Journal. This magazine is the official one of the 33rd Degree Council, the one that runs all of Freemasonry. And this is a close-up of pages 30 and 31 of the same issue of this magazine. And it shows on the right Robert Joseph Dole, 33rd Degree U.S. Senator from Kansas. That means that Bob Dole went through the 30th degree and took a sword in his hand and vowed to destroy Christianity. Now, I remember that millions of Christians voted for Bob Dole in the 1996 presidential election. And by the way, I was not one of them. And I would like to ask this question. Why would Christians vote for a man who has taken a vow to destroy Christianity? And if you answer, we did not know, the next question is, why didn't we Christians know? And the answer is, because this conspiracy does not want Christians to know. Now back to the discussion. Please do not expect the Masons to directly admit that they are out to destroy religion and the government. Because as some of the Masons have taught those who read their literature, they will cannot conduct their affairs in public, but will do so in secret. However, as we have seen by reading their own literature, sometimes they are very blatant and tell anyone who is interested just who they are and what they believe. And as a result of all of this research, membership in the Masons is dropping. A friend of mine, not a Mason, but a researcher into the Masonic Lodge, told me he called a Southern California Masonic official who told him that membership in the Masons has fallen from 4.8 million, 4,800,000 in 1978 to 3 million in 2004, and it is reportedly down to 1.7 million in about 2008. John Robinson wrote on page 149 of his book that the present level of attendance at a lodge meeting is only 8 to 9 percent of the paid up members. So they are experiencing growth problems, and as a result, they are starting to advertise as a way of recruiting new members. This is an outdoor advertising sign asking Michigan males to, quote, share the secret, end quote. And this is a bumper sticker which is designed to get men to ask a mason to be a mason. To be one, meaning a mason, ask one. 
In other words, all of the truthful publicity we have been generating is having an effect, and they are reacting with membership drives. I have had Masons tell me that they take oaths prohibiting them from recruiting men to Masonry, that the man must ask to join. And the reason seems to be obvious. If the Mason finds out the secret of the Masons as a member and he rebels, the Masons can always say, you asked to join, we didn't ask you. In other words, all of the research of those who are exposing Masonry is having an effect. Membership is declining, and in their desperation, the Masons are conducting membership drives in violation of their own oaths. But that is not the case today. They are recruiting new members, as I said, and in my humble opinion, that is a good thing. Now it is time to explore the most controversial thing I will say during this presentation. So please remember my appeal to each of you to be members of a jury. Please hear me out, and then you will be free to decide whether or not I'm right or wrong. So if you are ready, here is the most controversial thing I believe. There will be no world government. Not as we envision it, as an all-powerful world government with the absolute power to impose a brutal dictatorship down on all of us. That is a bold-faced lie. There will never be such a thing, at least as far as these people want it to occur. And the reason is, this conspiracy does not want a world government. Now let me try to explain. This conspiracy created World War I by having many nations involved in a war. Traditionally, it was one or maybe two nations fighting another. But World War I was planned by this conspiracy to involve many nations so that they could say that Nations cause wars, and the solution is to abolish nations or nationalism and create a one world government. President Woodrow Wilson signed the League of Nations Treaty and brought it back to the United States, but the Senate refused to ratify it. So this conspiracy planned World War II, even bigger than the first, with more nations, more nations fighting each other nations. And the plan was to give the world the United Nations after it was over, to keep the world from creating another war. They murdered 53 million people to get us to this position. And the world, people of the world, and the people of the world should have been conditioned to accept their solution. Abolish national borders and create a one world government so powerful that no one would dare oppose it. That war ended with the creation of the United Nations in 1945. This is now, of course, the year 2010. 65 years later, and the United Nations has not become a world government. And the reason that it hasn't is because this conspiracy does not want a world government. There is no call for it to become a world government, especially amongst those who are in favor of the United Nations. Now let me discuss what they do want. And let me discuss the thoughts of Karl Marx, the so-called father of communism, of a way of illustrating my point. This is his book entitled The Communist Manifesto, first published in 1848. This particular one was issued in 1948 on the 100th anniversary of its writing. It was published by the Communist League 
and inside the book it reveals that it was written by a descendant of the Illuminati. Karl Marx was a member of the Illuminati other, under another name. This is part of page Roman numeral 11, and this is what this book reveals. The Communist League sprang from what was known as the League of the Just. The League of the Just was a, an offshoot of the Parisian Outlaws League, founded by German refugees in that city. So we have just seen the genealogy of the Communist League, which later became the Communist Party, being founded by German refugees. And then this is my conclusion. The German refugees were the scattering members of the Illuminati from Bavaria, now part of Germany. So I will repeat it. The Communist Party is the descendant of the Illuminati. And that is consistent with the writings of Adam Weishaupt, the founder of the Illuminati in 1776, 72 years before the Communist League. According to a book entitled Proofs of a Conspiracy by John Robeson, on page 112, Weishaupt wrote, The great strength of our order lies in its concealment. Let it never appear in any place in its own name, but always covered by another name and another occupation. So it did. It surfaced under the name of the Commerce League in 1848. Now what did Marx propose for the world? Briefly summarized, he wished to abolish private property, religion, nationalism, and the family. Now let's look at why he wanted these things eliminated. If you abolish private property because of the absolute of thou shalt not steal, you don't need policemen, jails, judges, and most wonderfully, attorneys. If you abolish religion, you don't need rabbis, priests, imams, and ministers, etc. If you abolish nationalism, you don't need borders, their armies, and navies, and border inspectors. And if you abolish the family, you don't need divorce courts, counseling services for married couples, foster families, and juvenile courts, etc. In other words, you don't need government. Someplace in my readings, I remember reading the thought expressed by Marx that government would wither and die. We will not need government in any form. Governments exist because of moral absolutes. There will no longer be a need for any form of government. That is the promise of the New World Order. No more tyranny of government and religion, or the combination of the two. So here is my opinion as to why we are being told by this conspiracy that there will be a world government. As long as we do not have one in place, We believe we are free. We are being conned because the New World Order will have no government or religion to rule us. Unless you call the freedom of each man to decide for himself, in fact, probably we should say the liberty of each man to decide for himself a government, And that state of affairs will be the culmination of Lucifer's desire to replace God on the earth. To bring order out of chaos. Just before I close, I would like to bring you a good example 
of just what this new world order is. I would like to discuss another individual who is explaining just what this new world order b believes in. This is Alvin Toffler who wrote this book entitled The Third Wave in 1980. This book describes him as one of the world's best known social thinkers and a futurist and that his works are read in more than 50 countries. And let me add that Mr. Toffler is in agreement with the changes he wrote about. And Ralph Epperson is in total opposition. And here's what he wrote. Beneath the seemingly senseless events, there lies a startling and potentially hopeful pattern. Many of today's changes are not independent of one another, nor are they random. They are, in fact, parts of a much larger phenomena. The death of industrialization. That means that we will no longer enjoy the fruits of an industrialized society, meaning that we will no longer produce more electrical appliances, tools, cars, etc. What else could he mean by that? Middle class America, those who enjoy the products of an industrialized society, will have to be eliminated. How do you accomplish that? One way is to cause an economic depression where workers lose their jobs and cannot pay for their middle class lifestyle. Another way is to export all of our industrial jobs to foreign nations. Ultimately, it means the destruction of the middle class. Mr. Toffler then went on to discuss the future and the rise of a new civilization. This new civilization is slowly emerging in our lives. And blind men everywhere are trying to suppress it. Here he's writing about us, those in opposition. This new civilization brings with it new family styles. America for over 200 years was built upon the family consisting of a husband and a wife and children, if any. But today, America is legalizing marriages of two men and two women. In other words, the traditional families being downplayed and other forms of marriage are being created. This new civilization, according to Toffler, brings with it changed ways of working. America used to be an industrial giant among the nations of the world. America has in the past produced the highest standard of living amongst the nations of the world. While other nations were living in poverty, we had a high standard of living and we enjoyed the benefits of the free enterprise system. But now, high paying jobs are being exported to other nations, resulting in lower wages in America. And this is being done to lower our standard of living. In other words, it is intended for us to lose our high standard of living and to live with less, just like the socialized nations of the world with a lower standard of living. Mr. Telford went on, this new civilization brings with it changed ways of loving. America's public schools are teaching that homosexuality and lesbianism are alternative lifestyles. The movies and television programs are featuring homosexuals and lesbians in their productions as a way of changing our ways of loving. This new civilization brings with it changed ways of living. Many Americans are now living together without marriage, whereas in the past, couples got married before they lived together. That means we are changing our ways of living. 
this new civilization brings with it a new economy. America is experiencing an economic downturn. And it was planned to happen by those in favor of the new world order. People are losing their homes and personal property because they have lost their jobs and can no longer meet their monthly payments. If the wife who used to care for the family's children at home decides to join her husband in the workforce to make their payments, the children will be placed in daycare centers, which means someone else will be raising the children or their children during the day. This new civilization brings with it new political conflicts. Communism used to be this nation's biggest political conflict, and now Russia, the major communist nation, has divided and rejected the economic philosophy of Karl Marx, the father of communism. Now our new political conflict is radical Islam and terrorism. I would like to interrupt the ideas of Alvin Telfer to insert the thoughts contained in the letter written by Albert Pike in 1871. What we are about to read is quite possibly the most controversial material written by him, or at least attributed to him. The claim is made by some researchers that Pike wrote a letter to Giuseppe Mazzini, another key Masonic leader, on August the 5th, 1871, in which he outlined the Masonic plan for three world wars. Giuseppe Mazzini, who lived between 1805 and 1872, was a contemporary of Pike's and was a fellow Mason. He was also the founder of the Mafia. The M in Mafia stands for Mazzini. And the Propaganda Due Masonic Lodge, the Italian organization responsible for the assassination of the Catholic Pope John Paul I, the Pope just before the last two. Many researchers believe that one clue that the Pope was poisoned by the Masons is the fact that he died on his 33rd day in office. If nothing else, it's just once again another strange coincidence. There are some who believe, who some, there are some who do not believe that Mr. Pike wrote this letter and that it is a fraud. However, one can only ask how anyone would know that an individual did not write a letter unless the individual himself denied it and there's no record that Pike disavowed the letter. Lastly, if Mr. Pike did write this letter for a conspiracy, they would certainly do all within their power to make certain that no one found it, and if they did, they would move to discredit it. But there is a way of reasonably determining if an individual could have written a letter, and that is by comparing its content to other material that it is known that the individual did compose, and that is something that today's historians can do quite easily. The reader is directed to the two quotes written by Manley P. Hall that the Masons are far more powerful than the overwhelming majority of citizens would acknowledge, and that could mean that they are certainly capable of planning major wars such as three of them. Mr. Pike's letter is a blueprint for events that would play themselves out in the 20th and 21st centuries. It is this blueprint which I believe unseen leaders are following today, knowingly or not, to engineer the plan for three world wars. The first place that I found this letter was in a book written in 1957 entitled The Mystery of Freemasonry, uh, Freemasonry Unveiled. The author of that book claimed that the letter was documented in 1895 in another book, so that if both of these books are legitimate, it was certainly written prior to the First World War, which started in 1914 and lasted until 1918. 
The letter that Pike wrote shows that in 1871 he worked out a military blueprint for three world wars, all to occur in the 20th and 21st centuries. Following are extracts, extracts of that letter showing how three world wars have been planned for many generations. The First World War, 1914 to 1918, must be brought about in order to permit the Illuminati to overthrow the power of the czars in Russia and of making that country a fortress of atheistic communism. At the end of the war, communism will be built and used in order to destroy the other governments and in order to weaken their religions. The Second World War, 1941 to 1945, must be this war, and it must be brought about so that the not brought about so that Nazism. Now this is interesting. Notice that Pike used the word Nazi to describe the movement led by Adolf Hitler, and this could cause one to doubt that this letter was written about 60 years before Hitler made his appearance in Germany. If the letter is valid, Mr. Pike certainly set the pattern for the World War, but it could also mean that the letter is a fraud. However, listen to this. During the Second World War, international communism must become strong enough in order to balance Christendom, which would be then restrained and held in, in check until the time when we would need it for the final social cataclysm. After the Second Civil War, the Second War, Second, <laughs> Second World War, communism was made strong enough to begin taking over weaker governments at the Potsdam Conference in 1945. Churchill, Truman, and Stalin built the Iron Curtain by turning over a large portion of Europe to Russia. And on the other side of the world, the aftermath of the war, war with Japan helped to sweep the tide of communism into China, all with the collusion of the American government. And here is the plan for World War III. The Third World War must be fomented by unleashing the nihilists. Webster's Dictionary defines the nihilists as any violent revolutionary movement involving the use of terrorism. This implies that the Muslims are also controlled by this conspiracy. So now you can see that indeed 9-11 was an inside job. The true test of this letter, allegedly written by Albert Pike, is did it predict the future? Because if it did, someone from an organization that shapes the destinies of worlds knew the plan. In fact, they not only knew the plan, they made the plan. And if you want to know more about this letter, I've written a seven-page article entitled, The Masons Planned Three Wars. If you want a copy, please send me a written request for one to the address shown at the end of this DVD, and I will gladly send it. Now let me continue with the thoughts of Alvin Toffler in his book entitled, The Third Wave. The dawn of this new civilization is the single most explosive fact of our lifetimes. Humanity faces the deepest social upheaval and creative restructuring of all time. We, and notice that he's saying that he is in support of this social upheaval, so we are engaged in building a remarkable new civilization from the ground up. The jolting changes we are now experiencing are not chaotic or random, but that they form a sharp, clearly discernible 
pattern. When we finally understand this, many seemingly senseless events become suddenly comprehensible. And that ends the comments of Alvin Toffer. Simply stated, all of these changes in the way we live our lives are called the New World Order. And they are being orchestrated by a conspiracy of Masons and others. This nation is going somewhere because it was envisioned and promised in 1782 by this nation's founding fathers who had a hidden vision for this nation. And the future they envisioned for this nation was a world that was envisioned by Lucifer, also called Satan or the devil. While I am here, I must make this point about the naming of our nation. The American people have been told by the majority of the historians who have examined this nation's past that the name America was named after Amerigo Vespucci, supposedly the navigator for Christopher Columbus. But there is an alternative explanation. William Still, in his book entitled New World Order, offers the following explanation. The name America may be the product of secret societies. In an 1895 magazine named Lucifer, James Price gave an insight into the meaning of the word America. He said that the supreme god of the Mayan culture of Central America, known as Quetzalcoatl elsewhere, was known as Amaru, Amaru in Peru. Amaru's territory was known as Amaraku. The word ku or ka, de uh, depending on gender apparently, means land of or territory of. So Amaru's territory was known as Amaraku. According to Price, from the latter came the word America. America is translated land of the serpent. Mr. Price was not the only one to make this claim. Robert B. Stacy Mudd wrote a book entitled Atlantis, Mother of Empires, in which he attempts to make the claim that the Mayans came from the nation known as Atlantis, an island that allegedly sank during an earthquake. This is not the place to examine his charges, but he does draw another startling conclusion. Quetzalcoatl, the Mayan god, was known as Cucucan amongst the Aztecs. In Peru, he was known as Amaru. But all of these names have, a, have an identical meaning, in other words, the feathered serpent. From the Peruvian name comes Amar Aka. This is once again a photograph of a feathered serpent in the 33rd degree Masonic Temple in Washington, D.C. Notice that the head of the serpent has wings. It is a feathered serpent. The feathered serpent would have flown from the old world to the new world, meaning America. Mr. Still adds one of the thoughts of another writer who claimed to know the truth about the origins of the name. It is important first to note, it, to note that the people living in the United States of America are not the only Americans. All of the people who live in the New World are Americans. The continents are called North America and South America, and regions are called Latin America and Central America. Here is the official position as written by Manley Palmer Hall, one of the greatest Masons of all time in his book entitled America's Assignment with Destiny. Since the serpent is frequently a symbol of Lucifer, it is no exaggeration to extrapolate from this that 
America way mel may well mean hold on America this is not going to be pleasant America way may well mean land of Lucifer so that revelation that America was named after Amaru another name for the feathered serpent god and the feathered serpent is a symbol of Lucifer another name for Satan the devil is quite possibly the true explanation of the naming of America I am convinced that America was named after Lucifer by our founding fathers and that they knew that as they were creating this nation that means that our founding fathers were not great and noble men at all forgive me for this but the evidence says they had to be Luciferians what else makes sense they knew what they were doing and if I had the ability to go back to the days when we were, when they were writing the Constitution in 1787 this is how that painting would have looked it is appropriate to end this speech with the brilliant words of warning from Marcus Tullius Cicero a member of the Roman Senate who lived from 106 to 43 BC it seems that he has summarized all of that I have offered today a nation can survive its fools and even the ambitious but it cannot survive treason from within an enemy at the gates is less formidable for he is known and carries his banner openly but the traitor moves amongst those within the gate freely his sly whispers rustle through all the alleys heard in the very halls of government itself for their traitor appears not a traitor he speaks in accents familiar to his victims and he wears their face and their arguments he appeals to the baseness that lies deep in the hearts of all men he rots the soul of a nation he works secretly and unknown in the night to undermine the pillars of the city he infects the body politic so that it can no longer resist a murderer is less to fear I would like to draw this speech to a close with this rather <laughs> amusing photograph that has made the rounds on the internet some time ago it shows a hunter sleeping with his rifle in his lap and a deer sneaking in while he's asleep to eat his lunch please notice that the hunter is asleep with his rifle I would like to use this photograph to illustrate a point we are the sleeping hunter and while we are sleeping this conspiracy is secretly sneaking in to eat our lunch and my admonition to you and the public is this it is time to wake up thank you so very very much and may God bless America
The laws of thermodynamics are the most universal and best proved generalizations of science, applicable to every process and system of any kind. The first law states that no energy is now being created or destroyed. And the second law states that as energy is being converted and used, it decays, meaning it dispenses, it disperses, it disperses and cannot be used again. What he is saying is that once you use energy, you cannot regather it and use it again. A match is potential energy, but once you light it, it releases its energy and you cannot regather it and use it again. So Dr. Morris here means that someday the universe will lose all of its heat and there will be a heat equilibrium because the universe will decay until all temperatures will be the same, all locations in the universe will be the same temperature. There will be no more hot and cold. I like to use the example of a tub of cold water into which you drop scalding hot ball bearings. After a while the heated ball bearings will give off all of their heat and there will be a state of equal temperature. Since this eventuality, since this eventual heat equilibrium of the universe has not yet occurred, and since it will occur in time, if these processes of decay continue, the second law proves that time and therefore the space matter time universe had a beginning. The universe must have been created. But the first law says it couldn't have been self created. The only resolution of the dilemma posed by the first and second laws is that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. But Albert Pike, perhaps the greatest mason of all time, said it himself that Dr. Morris was wrong. At least three times. He was saying that there was no creation. Now let me show you a little evidence by a little example that he is dramatically wrong. This is a picture <laughs> taken uh, of me in 1985 when I was thinking about the universe out in the desert. It was taken when I had hair and all of that thinking must have made me nearly bald just a few, <laughs> just a few years later. This bright pink slice represents the energy in the universe. The high point on the left side represents the universe fully created with all of the energy it needs. Then as it goes through eternity the energy is decreasing and then at the right side all of the energy has been used and there will be a heat equilibrium. That means that the universe has a life expectancy just like the Bible that talks about a 70 year average life. So once again the universe had a beginning and a middle and then an end and then it had no energy left to utilize and there was a heat equilibrium. So the universe has a life of a certain amount of years and only a certain amount of years, meaning it could not have been given an eternal life. The line on this slide represents eternity, although it would be impossible for me to show it all on this slide because there is no beginning and no... The first ten words of the Bible, Genesis 1-1 read, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Notice that this had to be a creation out of nothing since the word beginning implies that there was a time before the creation when there was nothing. There would have been no need for a beginning if God took existing materials to form the universe. Now the Bible teaches that it was Jesus, that part of the triune God, who created the universe. But Albert Pike renounced the first ten words of the Bible when he wrote this. To say that the world came forth from nothing is to propose a monstrous absurdity. However, there's no mistake about who their God is. As I said, he's called the great architect of the universe. 
He is not the creator God of the Bible. He is not Jesus, as we have seen. According to Mr. Pike, if you believe that the universe was created out of nothing, then you believe in a monstrous absurdity. Mr. Pike repeated this thought in his book entitled Magnum Opus on page 18 of his closing instructions of the 32nd degree ritual. This is what he wrote. As the world is unproduced and indestructible, and as it had no beginning and will have no end. Now let me review what he just said. If the world was unproduced, there was no producer. If it had no beginning, it was not created out of nothing. If it was not created, there was no creator. If there was no creator, there is no Jesus. And to believe in Jesus is to believe in a monstrous absurdity. So the Christians and the Jews who believe that the God of the Bible created the universe out of nothing believe in a monstrous absurdity. Apparently in an effort to make certain that the Mason who reads his books would not miss the point, Mr. Pike repeated the thought on page 66 of this 32nd degree in his book entitled Legenda. But it will certainly be difficult to prove by any direct language of the scriptures that God created the universe out of nothing. So the words in the Bible that read in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth are not direct language because according to Mr. Pike there is no such thing as direct language proving this. Yet it can be proven that God did create the universe out of nothing. Before we examine the next area in this speech, may I explain the laws of thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is the study of heat exchange. Now let me introduce you to Dr. Henry Morris who phrased it in his commentary on Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 of his book entitled The Defender's Study Bible. By the way, but while I'm discussing Dr. Morris, may I mention that he was the founder of the Institute of Creation Research, perhaps the world's leading creationist organization. If you are not on their mailing list, may I suggest that you become so by visiting their website shown here. Now this is what Dr. Morris wrote. Part 7. I would now like to return to Alice Bailey's book entitled The Externalization of the Hierarchy. She wrote, the Masonic movement will meet the need of those who can and should wield power. It is the custodian of the law. And it is the seat of initiation. It holds in its symbolism the ritual of deity. And the way of salvation is pictorially preserved in its work. The methods of deity are demonstrated in its temples. And under the all-seeing eye, the work can go forward. And I've shown you from their own materials that they worship Lucifer. So the Masons are expecting someone to lead them into a world where there will be no restrictions on the individual's right to reason. In this world, man will be free to decide for himself in all things. According to the Masons, man's desire is to be free of any restraints on his freedom. Religion is not to instruct him how to lead a good life. He must be free to choose his own course of action because he must be free to choose whatever action pleases him. This is the vision of the future for the Mason. What Mr. Pike is saying is that the God of the Bible gave man free choice. And then that God restricted his free choice by teaching him to do or not do certain things by staying 
thou shalt and thou shalt not. For man to be totally free, to make all his own decisions, he must remove God and his moral absolutes from the world. Then man will be completely free to exercise his free choice. A God who restricts man's freedom of choice is a tyrant. That is what Mr. Pike is saying. Additional proof comes from other quotations from Mr. Pike. Masonry allows free, full freedom. Masonry allows full freedom of thought and freedom of conscience and the right of private judgment. These ideas of Mr. Pike are hard to understand. If a Christian goes to a Bible-believing church and that church teaches him that the God in the Bible has instructed him not to steal, for instance, Mr. Pike appears to be saying that the Christian is to come out from that church because no church has the right to restrict your right of private judgment. This is utter nonsense. A Christian freely chooses to follow Christ, and when he does so, he will wish to obey his commandments and moral teachings. But Mr. Pike said that no church has the right to expect its members to follow a righteous path. Mr. Pike continues, as Masons, we deny the right of any church to prescribe to men what they shall believe. Here it is again. This is pure nonsense. I will further explain why I believe this way a little later. When the church governs, man is ruled by superstition. And when the state governs, he is ruled by fear. Ignorance must be transmuted into wisdom and superstition into an illumined faith before men can live together in harmony and understanding. If this is harmony and understanding, I don't want it. But there it is in his own words. The battle lines are being drawn, but Mr. Pike is dramatically wrong when he says on page 530, if all men were Masons, that world would be a paradise. Because Pike's world, where only Masons live, is so horrible that the moral mind cannot comprehend it. So if you want to know your more, if you want to know more about the Masonic future, you might consider reading my second book entitled The New World Order. Because it is the future of America and ultimately the world unless we understand what it is and then inform others and then prevent it. The choice is ours. I must again, once again, I must once again be honest with you. Not everyone agrees with my book entitled The New World Order. Now I, I know that that comes as a surprise to all of you, but it is true. In fact, I want, <laughs> I want to read you a letter from one such person. He wrote this letter to me on October the 9th, 1999. To Ralph Epperson, read The New World Order. This book is so st <laughs> this book this book is so stupid that I couldn't stop reading it. Now, if a man uh, finds a book is too stupid to read, then you throw it away, burn it, give it away, put it aside. But here he says, I couldn't stop reading your stupid book. Talk about right wing. <laughs> talk about right wing crazies. You're the worst. Now think about this. One would think that if he thought my book was crazy, he should have said, you are the best crazy person I've ever seen. He's saying here that I am the worst crazy person, which means he thinks I, <laughs> he thinks I am truly intelligent. But then he betrays his judgment when he ends with this comment. I think that Bill Clinton is the best president this country ever had. And I will, I will leave it up to you to tell me which one of us is crazy. But enough of this. Please let me return to the subject at hand. 
I want you to know the situation is worse than this. Albert Pike wrote many other books, but one entitled Agenda of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry has a quotation that is very revealing and should be examined before the reader proceeds with a further study of the goal of the Masonic Lodge. He wrote this book in 1888 and was published by the 33rd Degree Council. The th key revelation in this book is the evidence that Albert Pike does not believe in a creator God. This quote taken from page 109 of Pike's comments on the 28th degree should clear up the question once and for all as to who the God of the Masons, called the great architect of the universe, really is. Because it is not the God of the Bible, the God who created the universe. No end to time. But just for the sake of our discussion, let's presume that this line represents billions and billions of years. Now in this slide, I have shown the universe life on one end and me at the other. That means that the universe had its life way before I thought about it. And the conclusion I must make is that this is impossible because the universe hasn't burned out yet. I can see the sun and it is, it is still burning and this scenario is not true. And this is another possibility. The universe has not been created and it is in a future date. Obviously, I could not be thinking about the universe if it had not been created yet. So this scenario is impossible as well. The third scenario is the only possibility. The universe has already been created and I am somewhere inside its life, which means it is not burned out yet, but it will someday. I hope this explanation has made sense to you. Because even though I've lost much, <laughs> much of my hair from all of this thinking, I can still think with what I have left. So Albert Pike's statement, if you believe in a created universe, you believe in a monstrous absurdity, is the monstrous absurdity. Let me now discuss one more evidence that this claim by Albert Pike is dramatically wrong. This is a picture of Sir Fred Hoyle, one of the world's leading astronomers, until he passed away several years ago. He is actually Sir Fred Hoyle, having been knighted in 1972 by Queen Elizabeth for his work in astronomy. Fred Hoyle coined the phrase, the Big Bang, that attempts to explain that the universe was once a small ball of energy and matter, which exploded for some unknown reason, producing the universe as we see it today. By the way, those who believe in the Big Bang Theory never answered the question, why, I'm sorry, where, where did this little ball of energy and matter come from? So they want us to believe this little ball has been there forever and on some date in the past, it simply exploded. And they do not explain why it suddenly exploded. Because they will not deal with the creator who created the universe out of nothing. In a famous 1950 BBC radio series, Hoyle called the idea of an explosion of the little ball of matter and energy preposterous. He said, the Big Bang Theory refers to an epoch that cannot be reached by any form of astronomy. And in more than two decades, it has not produced a single successful prediction. He wrote a book entitled The Intelligent Universe in 1983, in which he wrote, It is apparent that its chances of life originating by accident are so remote that they can be completely ruled out. Life cannot, cannot, cannot have arisen by chance. He compared the random appearance of a single cell to the likelihood that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard 
might assemble a 747 